Inshallah ta'ala, uh, for today's khutbah, I want to uh, talk about an amazing surah of the Qur'an. Um, it is a surah, the uh, prototypical surah of consolation, a surah that has a lot of resonance for us uh, always and for all times. Surah Al-Duha, chapter 93 of the Qur'an. <clears throat> Uh, some historical background. We know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he went to the Mountain of Light and he received the revelation, the Wahi descended upon him um, from Jibreel Alayhi Salam and he was commissioned as a Prophet and he saw Jibreel Alayhi Salam in the incarnated form and when he exited the cave he saw Jibreel Alayhi Salam in the way that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala created him covering the horizons and then he heard uh, voices greeting him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, saying, ya, saying, Assalamu alayka, ya Rasulallah, oh, peace be upon you, O Messenger of God. And he would look, and there was nobody there. It was as if the stones and the trees were greeting him, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And of course, he went to his wife on Mother Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, radiallahu ta'ala anha, and he explained what had happened. And of course, we know they went to Waraqa bin Nawfal, who said, Qad ja'aka anna Musa al-Akbar kama ja'a ila Musa. That he said to the Prophet sallallahu that the great Namus, the great Nomos, the great law of God has come unto you, just as it came upon Musa alayhi salam. Now, a few more uh, revelations came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then there was a break in the revelation and during this break from what we can tell from the sources the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was experiencing a bit of anxiety uneasiness and worry even some depression why was he experiencing this is because the Prophet Sallallahu was a very self-reproaching person. He had thought within himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this is from his tawadur, this is from his humility Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that perhaps he had done something that angered Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. That the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was someone who wasn't always self-victimizing himself. That he wasn't blaming others for his problems. He turned the spotlight inward, as it were. Imam at tabari says, on top of this, some of the mushrikeen had caught wind that the Prophet ﷺ was declaring himself a prophet or that he was claiming that revelation was coming to him. And they began to mock and ridicule him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And some of them said, in ridicule, your shaitan has left you. And some of them said to him in sarcasm and ridicule, in the Rabbahu wa Da'ahu wa Qalahu. Indeed, his Lord has forsaken him and hates him. Now, when Jibreel alayhi salam did eventually come back to the Prophet, وسلم, it is mentioned in a hadith that is mentioned by many, many of the Mufassirin in the Quran that the Prophet وسلم, he said to Jibreel alayhi salam, I felt a type of anxiety when you did not visit me. And it's because I fell in love with you. This is what he's saying to Jibreel alayhi salam. I fell in love with you and felt a sense of longing towards you and I wanted to see you again. And Jibreel alayhi salam said to him sallallahu alayhi salam, I fell in love with you as well. And I felt a longing to see you again. But I am a servant under command. And I only descend by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So why was there a break in the revelation? Allahu alam. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to teach him and by us and us by extension as to how to deal with this type of situation in our lives. Perhaps sometimes we feel as if we are cut off, as it were, from divine providence. Something I hear a lot from the youth is, you know, I'm not feeling it anymore. I used to hear the Quran, this is what I'm hearing. I used to hear the Quran and I would have a chill go up my spine and now I don't feel anything. I used to pray Fajr and I feel a sense of spirituality throughout my day. Or something like, well, I don't think my du'as are being answered anymore. I just don't feel like they're being answered. Dealing with the latter, from the ahadith, the ulama have gathered that when we make du'a, one of three things happen. 
Of course, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ when my servants ask you concerning me, say that I am indeed close to them. That I answer the supplication of every supplicant when he calls upon me. We know that the Prophet said in the sound hadith, that supplication, dua, is the essence of worship. So they say one of three things will happen. Either Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you what you're asking for in this dunya. He'll give it to you. And all of us can testify to this. There are certain things we make dua and it happens in the dunya. Or he won't give you that specific thing, but will give you something better. And you might not perceive it to be better. And this better thing could simply be the fact that he saved us. He prevented a musibah from, from afflicting us. So it's ultimately good for us. But sometimes we don't know what's good for us. Perhaps you love something that is not good for you, that is bad for you, that is evil for you. Or a third possibility, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't give us what we're asking for in this dunya at all. Then on the yawm al-qiyamah, as it states in the hadith, people will see jibal, mountains of good deeds, mountains of rewards. And they will ask, what is this? And the answer will come that this is from your dua, your supplications. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not answer your supplications in the dunya, but He rewarded you for making those supplications. In effect, answering your dua in, on the yawm al-qiyamah. And the servant will say, I wish none of my duas were answered in the world. I wish that none of my duas were answered in the world. In a hadith of Tirmidhi, there's some weakness in the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ, he said, Allah will answer as long as one does not become hasty. يستعجل. And they said to the Prophet ﷺ, what does it mean to become hasty? And he said, that's when one says, دَعَوْتُ رَبِّي فَمَا إِسْتَجَابَ لِي That's when the servant says, I made dua to my Lord and he never answered me. So we have to be steadfast. We have to keep asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of my teachers even said, keep nagging. He used that word. Keep nagging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He never grows tired. When someone nags us, we get tired, we get frustrated. But when we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeatedly, this is something that He loves and something that will benefit us. Inshallah ta'ala. So the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what duha, taking a qasam, taking an oath, by the soothing morning light, and the ulama, many of the ulama here say, duha is a symbol for the revelation itself. Duha is the soothing morning light, the, the, the sunlight before it gets too hot. It's very soothing. And they say this is a symbol of the revelation. Now the Prophet wasallam, he was a Hanif. He was a, an archetypal monotheist. He never worshipped idols. He never engaged in the frivolity of the culture of the pre-Islamic Arabs. He was someone who was dedicated to the creed of Ibrahim السلام, even before the wahi descended upon him And he would practice tahannuth, which is a way of saying that he would shun the idolatry of his people and seek solitude with his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what his intellect, his aql suggested to him, his rational faculty through his intellect. This is how keen and sharp his intellect was and how pure his fitrah was. And then the naql, the revelation descended upon him وسلم, And you have a convergence of intellect and revelation, aql and naql. Imam al-Razi, he says, this is the meaning of nurun ala nur. In the famous ay ayatul nur, nurun ala nur, naql and aql, revelation and intellect. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, yakadu zaytuha yudi'u wa law lam tamsasu nar. That that which is internal and, and Imam al baghawi mentions, that Imam al-Razi also mentions that the misbah in this ayah is a, is, a, uh, is a reference to the heart of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam, And that the oil of the, of the lamp, that which is internal to the Prophet wasallam, his pure fitrah or his rational faculty, it would almost illuminate even though the fire the nar, which is a symbol of the revelation itself, has not even touched it. Meaning that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, understanding of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, his theological understanding, if you will, and his ethical worldview was almost perfectly in line with what would become uh, uh, in the Sharia and the Wahi. And that there were sparks of this illumination that were witnessed by people in the pre-Islamic days. 
pre-prophetic miracles, irhasat, that were, that, were, that were noticed by people, like Bahira the monk. So we have this convergence of revelation and intellect. وَاللَّيْلِ إِذَا سَجَى And by the night when it is still, this continues the qasam. And the ulama mentioned, some of the ulama mentioned here that this is a reference to the, the, uh, the break in the revelation. That the duha is a reference to the revelation when it's shining and then there's a break. In other words, whether you're receiving revelation or not, whether you sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are receiving revelation or not, ma wada'aka rabbuka wa ma qala, your Lord has not forsaken you, nor does he hate you, nor does he hate. And qala here, as we mentioned in many, many uh, lectures, is a transitive verb, fi'l muta'addi, which, which normally requires a direct object. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here does not mention the direct object. He doesn't say qala ka, because he would never even insinuate that he hates the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here identifies himself as the Lord of the Prophet sallallahu The Rabb, the imminent deity, the one who takes care of you. This is why Sufyan al he said, on the Yawm al-Qiyamah, I would rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to judge me than my own parents. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves me more than my own parents. He is a Rabb. He is the Lord, the imminent deity, the one who takes care of us. And the afterlife is better for you than the here and now. That's one way of interpreting it. Or that what is later in life is better than the present moment. And both meanings could be true at the same time. In other words, be optimistic. Have hope in the future. Don't be pessimistic. Don't be a cynic. Be optimistic. Ibn Hajar mentions and many other ulama mention that at, before the battle of Khandaq when the Sahaba were digging the trench a morale was low they're digging ditches the Prophet Sallallahu was seen he was very slender they weren't eating they tied rocks around their stomachs he tied two rocks around his stomach Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and there was this huge stone that nobody could crack so the Prophet Sallallahu he picked up a pickaxe and he struck it, and a spark flew. And he says, he said, I, I have been given the keys of Syria. The keys of Syria. They're about to be attacked by a confederacy. 10,000 people are about to storm the oasis of Medina to Manawara, Mushrikeen from the south, Bedouin mercenaries from the east. You have internal units, that internal people in Medina, uh, Bani Israel and Munafiqeen that are causing problems. This is an all-out siege. And what does he say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? I have the, the keys, I have seen, I have seen the, the keys of Syria. The keys of Syria have been given to me. Syria is under Byzantine control, Roman Empire. And then he strikes it again, and there's another spark, and he says, Allahu Akbar. I have been given the keys of Persia. And he strikes it a third time. Allahu Akbar, another spark in the, in the stone shatters. I've been given the keys of Yemen. Morale was low. He picked up his people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, عجب أن أمر المؤمن. How, how wonderful, how incredible is the affair of the believer. إن أمره كله له خير. All of his affairs are good. All of his affairs are good. When he's afflicted with something, he's patient. In times of prosperity, he, he is grateful. أول ما يدعى إلى يوم ال... أول يدعى إلى جنتي يوم القيامة الذين the first people called the Jannah on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah are those who praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in prosperity and in adversity. <clears throat> what is later is better than the former. And soon your Lord will give you something, and the object here again is not mentioned. Will give you something, your Lord, the one who loves you and takes care of you. He's going to give you something, fatarda, and immediately you'll be pleased. Imam al Sayyuti mentions in his tafsir that when the Prophet ﷺ heard this ayah, he said, Lan arda wa wahidun, wa wahidun min ummati fin nar. I will never be pleased while even one person from my ummah is in the fire. So what is this thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the Prophet sallallahu 
that will immediately please him. The salvation of the entire ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The salvation of the entire ummah. There's a hadith in Tirmidhi where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, the last man to come out of the hellfire will come crawling out of the hellfire. The last mawahid, the true monotheist, come crawling out of the hellfire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to him, you will be given whatever you wish for and ten times the dunya. You will be given whatever you wish for and ten times the dunya. The answer, the, res the response of this man is interesting. He said, he said, أَتَّسْخَرُوا بِي وَأَنْتَ الْمَلِكِ are you mocking me? Are, are you ridiculing me? Are you make, making fun of me and you're the king? And, and Ibn Mas'ud who released the hadith, he said the Prophet Wasallam, when he mentioned that he smiled until his nawajib, his molars were showing. That this man was so profoundly struck by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that he's the last one, the worst of the believers, and he gets 10 times the dunya and everything he asked for, this must be a joke. You must be mocking me. This was his immediate response. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is obviously something again that applies to us by extension. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet sallallahu of past blessings. Alam yajidika yatiman fa'awa. Were you not an orphan? And he gave you shelter. The Prophet ﷺ's father died before he was born. His mother died when he was six. His grandfather died when he was eight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept taking care of him. Wasn't he taking care of you? All of us can think of a crisis we were in and we came out of it. Whether it's a family crisis or a financial crisis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us in the Quran, remember the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you. Remember the past, the past blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, and he found you. And with respect to the Prophet ﷺ, this does not mean that the Prophet was astray or lost or something. It means that he was searching, that he was without sacred law, that the Sharia ah had not been revealed to him. Fahada, and then he guided you with the wahi. But now look at ourselves. Maybe we were leading lives completely heedless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how did we get here then? Think about it. How did you get to Salatul Jumu'ah? How did you get to Islam? It's a ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At one point we were totally heedless. At one point, this was not a priority at all. I'll tell you something. When I was in ninth grade, I was at the San Ramon Library. And I was just studying there. And a South Asian brother who was an exchange student, I think he was in my history class, he saw me there. And he said, what is your name? I said, Ali. He said, oh, you're a Muslim. And I said, no, not really. My parents are Muslim, I think. He said, oh, really? So he started to tell me about the meaning of la ilaha illallah. And he started to tell me about Islamic ethics. And wallahi, I started laughing in his face. I mocked and derided him. I made fun of him. I made fun of his accent. I can remember this very, very clearly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not give up on me. You probably have similar stories in your own life. Remember these past blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These are things that he knows. Alam, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins a question with alam, it is a rhetorical question. In other words, remember that. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashabi al-fil. Didn't you see what your Lord did? In other words, remember what your Lord did to the companions of the elephant the year you were born. Why do you think that happened? That was protecting the city because you were going to be born. You are my Habib sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he found you burdened with massive pressure and he enriched you. Imam al baghawi he says here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enriched the Prophet وسلم, outwardly and inwardly. Outwardly through our lady Khadija al Kubra radiallahu ta'ala anha. That she was his helper and his patron, his first disciple. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her. Alayhi salam. 
and inwardly with what's known as ghina nafs the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said al ghina ghina nafs true true enrichment is the enrichment of the heart enrichment of the soul a soul that is free of desire for worldly things all that is other than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perishable and all that is perishable does not deserve to be in our hearts there's a hadith in our tradition of isa alayhi salam or isa alayhi salam the disciples the hawariyun they come to him and they say how do you, how is it that you can walk on water and he said bring me three objects gold stones and mud so they brought him these three objects and he said to he said to them what do you say about these three objects and they said oh the gold is better than the stones the stones are better than the mud he said they're all the same to me there's no difference learn the secret of that and you will transcend the physical you'll be able to walk on water ibn sarin he says that water when you see water in a dream the most prevalent meaning is that it's ilm that it's knowledge so that to walk on water means to attain the highest type of knowledge means to attain ma'rifatullah intimate knowledge of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we see the world for what it is that is just mud we will transcend this world and enter into a a type of knowledge of, of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a type of true knowledge the greatest type of knowledge and then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says to finish the surah fa amma al yatima fala taqhar and now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after reminding the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam of past blessings and by extension all of us we remember past blessings we didn't know anything we didn't know one iota in our mother's wombs we were nothing we had no consciousness we we're not conscious of anything at the time and now we're here now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he's saying now look to those who are less fortunate than you this is how to come out of anxiety out of depression what are we depressed about we're inundated with ni'am of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take a minute think about what what happened in the past how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided us to this time right now and then think about those who are less fortunate than us as for the orphan do not scorn him the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said the one who takes care of an orphan will be with me like this in paradise and he put up his index finger and his middle finger like this sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam will be in prophetic company allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says that if a man is struggling to take care of orphans and fears that he will not be able to treat them fairly then rather than discontinue his support he could marry additional women to help him take care of the orphans when khiftum ala tuqsitu fil yatama fankihu ma taba lakum min an-nisa'i mathna wa thulatha wa ruba'a it is not a necessary condition but it is the initial context such is the importance of taking care of the weakest of our human society of children فَأَمَّا الْيَتِيمَ فَلَا تَقْهَرْ وَأَمَّا السَّائِلَ فَلَا تَنْهَرْ And as for the beggar, do not repel him. Anas ibn Malik, he said that the Prophet sallallahu he never said la to anybody. Somebody asked him for something, if it was within his capacity, he would give to that person. He never said la except when he said la ilaha illallah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ The final ayah. And as for the blessing of thy Lord, proclaim imam al-qurtubi said that the ni'matullah mentioned in this final ayah of surah al-duha is a reference to the quran itself so what does this mean for us stay engaged with the quran don't leave the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but read it reflect upon it study its meanings memorize it implement it the Prophet sallallahu he said, Al-Qur'an hujjatul lak aw alayk aw kama qala. He said that the Qur'an is either a proof for you or against you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it a proof for us. The Prophet sallallahu he said, Man ta'allam al-Qur'an khayrakum man ta'allam al-Qur'an wa allamah. He said, the best of you are those who learn the Qur'an and teach it to others. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq to learn the Qur'an and to teach something of it to others. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wadduha wallayli idha saja ma wadda'aka rabbuka wa ma qala وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى
ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضالا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأونى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث